afternoon. Everyone having a good time so far? All right. So, how to arm yourself. If you're here for pen testing, you're in the right place. If you plan on buying one, you're in the wrong place. So these guys are uh, going to be talking about how to uh, create your own pen test D Dropbox. And let me go ahead and introduce them. So first we've got uh, Bo Bollock. That's him right there. And um, he's a security analyst, uh, pen tester. Uh, he's been with uh, Black Hills Information Security since 2014. And uh, says here he's had a multitude of security certifications from A to Z, you name it, it's there. Um, We've also uh, got uh, Ralph May, and uh, apparently uh, he's got six years of professional experience in information security. Six years. Yeah, but not in convergence today. Six years is two minutes, right? Yeah. And uh, he's got 10 years in IT. He's conducted security assessments. Um, it includes physical security, social engineering, internal, external network, and application pen testing, wireless assessments, advanced persistent threat actor simulations. I don't even know what any of those are. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, we've got Derek Banks. And um, he's been in the IT industry his entire life. That's a long time. That's a long time. Do you remember Nintendo? So, see? Who here does not know what Atari is? Oh, I remember those, yeah. And of course, Derek himself has a quite extensive long list. Forensics, incident response, creating custom host and network-based monitoring solutions, pen testing, vulnerability, uh, vulnerability analysis, and threat modeling. And he's also not a boring guy, so in his real life, he likes to spend his time with his family, staying physically fit. Okay, I agree with that. And uh, he likes to play with his bass guitar. <laughs> hey, you know, you sent me the 10-pager. I stayed up all night and studied. <laughs> I'll leave that to you guys. And with further ado. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and apologize in advance. My voice is a little messed up. I caught the flu last week. So I swear it's not the coronavirus. I promise. All right. So uh, I'll probably have to take a break and cough every once in a while. So this talk is how to arm yourself. So who here has heard of an arm processor? I, I assume quite a few of you, right? So this talk is about uh, how to use arm processors in offensive security. So you just got to hear all about us? So you want to hear all about us again? No, I'm just kidding. So uh, our, what, what is an ARM processor? So real quick, uh, they're small chips, they're risk-based, where, uh, say, an Intel processor is sys-based. It's a reduced instruction set made mainly for smaller, low-power devices. Does anybody know how many ARM devices there are in the world, or ARM processors? Yeah, billions, like 100 billion. It's ridiculous. So, um, you know, smartphones, uh, IoT devices, you know, chances are they're ARM, and they've become more and more powerful over the years. And so that's sort of what we're going to, you know, talk about. Yeah, so we're going to talk about ARM specifically with relation to building your own pen test Dropbox. So that's, that's the fun part. Um, we're going to walk through uh, a few different things characteristics that you might want to think about when you go through building a Dropbox. So what is a Dropbox? Um, oftentimes when we're on physical engagements uh, for, for penetration tests, um, there becomes a need for not just sitting in you know, the corner of, of like a conference room and trying to maintain as much access as we can while we're there, but instead actually leaving something behind. Um, and that's, that's where the Dropbox comes into play. So essentially, think of it this way, uh, a small form factor computer that we can leverage remotely uh, to attack a network. So this would be something you would plug into physically, a port on, on the target network that you're assessing. You would leave it behind, go out you know, back, back home and, and hack away from, uh, from the device remotely. Um, so we're going to walk through some specifications, some features, uh, and then ultimately we're going to talk about some really cool attacks uh, that we think are, are fairly unique um, and just, just interesting ways to, to utilize a Dropbox. 
Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the uh, some Dropbox history here. And actually, this really started with the first question that I got into when I was talking about a Dropbox or thinking about one or having to do an engagement. And that was uh, build or buy, okay? So you go look at the market right now for a Dropbox, you know, a drop drop device that you can actually buy right now. It's pretty scarce. Um, we just looked up, and I think um, the Pwn Plug and uh, Pawnee Express, they're not really making devices anymore. Um, if you guys had ever looked at those, they're pretty expensive, uh, like a thousand bucks for something that you know we could all pr pretty much put together pretty fast. Um, so, anyways, just to kind of run through this list real quick. So, the pros of buying something is small form factor, right? We can make this device really small. That's why the iPhone is super small. There's a lot of chips and stuff going on in there. Um, software, firmware support. Hopefully, we get some support from the vendor. Um, also, the simple setup and uh, they. Um, you get to use hacking hardware, right? So, um, but some of the buy cons: uh, limited software, uh, CPU limits. A lot of the software, or a lot of the hardware that I've seen now, like the Hack Five stuff. Not to knock on any of it, it uses MIPS. Okay, uh, MIPS has been around for a long time. The reason they use it is low power, uh, cheap, so on and so forth. Um, but it does have a lot of limitations, especially when it comes to software. Um, also, you can't upgrade them. Okay, so you're on an engagement, you want to change something up, you need something more, you need something less, you can't, you don't really have those options, right? Um, so it, it moves from there. So you got to buy another piece. So uh, building, uh, if we look at the building side, you can upgrade at will, right? You need a new wireless chip that works with the new OS, you can get it, right? You can put it in there, um, USB, USB based. Um, you can build to your requirements, okay? You need something super small for this one engagement, you need something bigger, or it doesn't matter in the next one, you can make that decision. Um, limitless software options, uh, you know, hardware support is only limited by the OS. Uh, with something like an ARM, there's pretty much every code will run on ARM nowadays. Uh, if you go look at uh, any build for most applications out there, there's an ARM version of it. Um, and you get to be a hacker. You get to build something. Uh, some of the cons, higher cost, okay? So putting this stuff together, economies of scale. When you start uh, building hardware, actually you can make it cheaper uh, when you build a thousand of them uh, as opposed to just one. Uh, larger size, it's hard to make them a little smaller, and then uh, more complex setup. So those are just a uh, quick rundown. So here are a couple devices that you may have seen. Uh, the the Pwn plugs up there in the corner. You got a Hack 5 Pineapple. Uh, I, th I believe that's the Hack 5 um, Land Turtle. And then some USBs that, you know, just drop everywhere. Um, and then obviously, you know, building your own device. Your own device is going to look, you know, whatever you want to look like. Yeah, so there's a little bit of history. I mean, this is not a new concept at all. Um, we've been building Dropboxes for a long time. And, um, you know, historically, I think I, the, some of the first ones I saw were like the, you know, very first Raspberry Pi was like one of the first uh, microcontroller devices that somebody used to build a Dropbox. And um, this, this particular device is one that I built back in 2015. Um, this one, uh, the, the main reason I built this particular device was to do NAC bypass. Um, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, but essentially it's, it's a lot of uh, organizations utilize network access control, um, which basically means you can't just go and plug a device into the network. So anyways, I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but um, that was a BeagleBone Black in 2015. In 2016, uh, I actually did a little bit of... Um, a whole blog post. Yeah, right? there's a whole yeah. blog post where I did some research and kind of compared um, BeagleBone Black with Raspberry Pi 3 and the Odroid C2 at the time, and that's... This is... This device was the Odroid C2, and this one actually I utilized on multiple engagements and was stellar. Like this was a fantastic Dropbox, small form factor. Um, it was perfect for my needs. This one I did not at the time actually uh, utilize an LTE back channel. This was just a Wi-Fi back channel, uh, which we'll we'll talk more about that in a minute. Yeah, so uh, I, I've had a little bit of experience too, and uh, yeah, try and get this through the TSA. So this was this was fun. Um, so uh, th this is uh, a, a coworker and I, in uh, 2018, we were on a physical engagement and um, we, we wanted to put a Dropbox in place. And you can, you can see here, here are the two USB uh, dongles for the Ethernet. And then there's the actual, I think that was a Beagle Bone. Now that I think about it, this right here, does anybody know what that is? So that was a USB LTE device, or, or sorry, I think it was 4G actually. Has anybody ever messed with uh, USB like dongles for cell? Do you, how how reliable are they? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think I sat there for about 15 minutes with Joff. I don't know if he's in here. He was down in the lobby going, "Okay, the dialer worked. Wait, 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 reboot it." 
So uh, part of this talk was us uh, actually finding something we'll talk about in a little bit that was reliable, uh, a 6FAB LTE hat. And what you can't see here, there's, this USB hub actually has a whole nother Wi-Fi dongle attached. I couldn't even like fit it all in the picture, right? So uh, part of the reason for this talk was us sort of standardizing this a little bit and making something that you can go build. If you find this under your desk, you've been breached. Yeah, this is, this right. is what you call a bad day. So it, it did work. I'll, I'll, granted, it did work, but it was definitely, that was fun getting through security. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk about the features. All right, so some of the features uh, when you're building a Dropbox device. Um, covert, um, putting it in a small casing, plants, other stuff like that. Get creative with it, right? What, what's actually in an office? What, you know, what should be in an office? Um, the physical size, um, how much power do you need? Um, you know, where are you going to place this? Whenever I go on physical assessments, I have a whole plan of what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it, and how I'm going to leave, right? The goal isn't to hang out, investigate every single you know, rock that I can find and, and dig up everything. The goal is to get in, execute, and leave as fast as I can, right? Not to hang out. So just real quick, how many people would question a wire going to their plant? Like a smart plant? Like maybe it tells you the weather or something? Yeah, if it has the weather, eh, I don't know. I mean, it's, a pretty, office, yeah, it's, a, it's pretty a pretty hip company. It's a pretty hip company. Right. <laughs> so... Uh, comms. All right, so this is one of the big ones. And actually, this is really the biggest focus point of a drop device, okay? Because pretty much I can put any drop device in your organization, and if it doesn't allow me to get outbound access, then it's pretty much just a power-sucking device. Um, so the physical connection, how are you going to get out? So Wi-Fi, uh, cellular back channel, that's my new preferred way to go, okay? Uh, as an organization, you can't just lock down all the cellular signal in your company, okay? Um, it's an FCC thing. Um, so C2 over your target network. So using their network, NAC, all the other stuff in place, right? So seeing these um, uh, wall outlets, Ethernet jacks, trying to take advantage of those, okay? Um, there's some mitigation controls in place, but it's just something to think about. Bluetooth, this is for, um, you know, obviously a local device, uh, and then how we're going to daisy chain this out. So we'll talk more about that. Power. Uh, here's another good one, uh, PoE. Um, so a lot of organizations do have PoE switches uh, just embedded within their in their organization. All the uh, jacks are PoE powered. Sometimes they're enabled, sometimes they're not. Having that in your arsenal is really great. It can avoid having to plug into something extra and can make for an easier uh, setup. If you're doing battery, um, obviously how much battery, how long the life is and stuff like that. That's really where ARM comes in is the battery life is so great that that's why you would use something like this as opposed to like a Nook or some x86 processor in there that's just you pretty much not going to run that on battery, okay? Yeah, so uh, I, we had mentioned before, uh, you know, ARM devices and the type we use. So we actually went with a Raspberry Pi 4. And the reason why is, is because man, it is a really nice, fast. Does anybody mess with a Raspberry Pi 4? Yeah, I'm, I'm four gig of RAM. You know, a quad not toys processor. anymore. Yeah, no, I mean, it's almost like a desktop replacement. I mean, I've, it's probably more powerful than, you know, half the computers. Oh, yeah, I'm old, sorry. Um, so, but... So we went with the Raspberry Pi 4 for uh, support and for aftermarket stuff. I mean, we were talking about uh, PoE, like our device, we have a PoE hat, and then also an LTE hat on top of that. So we have a nice stack of uh, uh, Pi hats on top of it. Who's this one? Yeah, so we talked about the physical things you might consider whenever you're building a Dropbox. Now let's talk about what you might actually do with the Dropbox, some requirements that you might have uh, for the assessment you're doing. Um, we talked about NAC earlier. Okay, So network access control traditionally keeps you from just plugging random things into a network. Um, this is a, a security control that most organizations put in place to make sure that only authorized devices that they say can connect to their network can connect. And that is probably the, the leading thing that prevents us from just leaving a Dropbox. because. Um, you know, you go and you just plug this in. A lot of times what will happen is they'll just straight up disable the port if it doesn't recognize the device. If you can't authenticate with the device, um, a lot of times you just get quarantined off into a separate VLAN. Um, so we have to start looking at NAC bypassing. And there's a few ways to go about doing this. First, uh, we can talk about just straight up layer two and layer three NATing. And that involves having uh, multiple U USB Ethernet adapters attached to our Dropbox. And essentially what you're doing is you're, you're man in the middling the connection between an authenticated host and the wall or in the, in the port, right? 
And essentially what you do is you bridge that connection and kind of analyze the traffic and look and say, okay, hey, the MAC address is on this side, is the wall, and this is the, the computer. And now let me, let me put those on either side of my adapter so that the wall thinks this is the, the computer and I'm, I'm just in the middle. Um, and, and basically through you know, a set of different IP table rules and EB table rules, um, you, can, you can make that work. Um, and I have, I have had it work, which is it's nice. Um, the other more easier solution of bypassing NAC traditionally is just find a phone, uh, like, a, like an IP like VoIP phone or a printer, because a lot of times um, if they're using 802.1x uh, NAC, that would involve you know, using a certificate installed on the device a lot of times. And most of the phones and printers, like old, especially older models, don't have the ability to install certificates on the devices. So what happens is they'll just whitelist the MAC address. And a lot of times what you can do is just either plug into the port because they've just whitelisted the port or uh, just, just uh, spoof the MAC address from the phone. Next. Um, wireless testing. So this could be um, something you build into your Dropbox build as well. Um, that, you know, obviously if you're on site with, with an assessment, um, you know, you have the opportunity to, to analyze wi wireless frequencies as well. Um, so, you know, you have to consider, are we going to add adapter, like wireless adapters? Are we going to start adding antennas? Are we going to, you know, what all are we going to actually put in this thing? Um, and it's still going to maintain uh, a stealthiness, you know? Um, and then uh, the last thing, general network testing, right? So, you know, Kali has an ARM image. Um, which works fantastic on the Raspberry Pi 4 and has you know, all your typical tools built in, Metasploit, uh, Nmap, um, you know, all your Impacket, TCP dump, that kind of yeah. stuff. The one thing that uh, I will say, go on to the next slide, if you want to do vulnerability scanning, you probably don't want to do it from an ARM device. <laughs> um, first off, there's no Nessus support at all, so you can't install Nessus on an ARM device. Um, we tried it last night. <laughs> um, and, you know, OpenVAS, technically works on ARM-ish. <laughs> it's very slow um, and a little janky. Um, <laughs> yeah, they don't have commercial support. Yeah, see, no one even raises their hand. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. It's like, uh... All right, let's move on. All right, automation. All right, yep, I'll talk about this. So Dropbox automation. So we're going to talk about Ansible real quick. Who's heard of Ansible? All right, good, awesome. Okay, so uh, Ansible is open source software. This is going to help automate uh, building out these images or builds or whatever we want to do, right? Um, why Ansible? Uh, it's Python 3 based now, so it's pretty easy to catch on. But the bigger thing is that um, it's got simple YAML based configuration. This is not really hard to get into. Um, there is a whole suite of modules out there to configure all kinds of things. Um, the best way to describe Ansible, if you have not used it, is if you had a bash, a bash script for something, you should dump that and go to Ansible and save yourself a whole lot of heartache, okay? Trust me. Your bash script is just not going to be as good. That's really what this was made to do, okay? Um, so, next slide. So, uh, one more. Okay. So, how would this work for like a drop device? So, um, and we're going to release this uh, after the talk. I have an Ansible script for uh, a couple of the drop devices that I've already built. And what it's going to do is install the software, configure things up for you so you can really kind of get rolling with it. But you can add more software later. You can change it however you want, right? It's just YAML. Uh, it's pretty easy to read. But to do that, I mean, all you're going to do is just create a Kali image. You could go down the, download the Kali image uh, for ARM-based system, write it to an SD card, pretty simple instructions, uh, get cloned the repo, Modify an inventory file. All you're really doing is specifying the host and then any kind of variables in there. What are variables? They could be like the password you want to change or what software you do or don't want installed. Things like that. And then just run the playbook. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's a great way to get rolling with it. Uh, the best part about it is you don't have to just accept whatever I thought was a good idea, okay? You can go in there and change it and be like, oh, that was a dumb idea or I've got a better way of doing this or I needed this software that wasn't on there. Um, the other great part about this is it's repeatable, meaning you can run this code over and over again. It's not going to mess anything up. It's not going to delete or it's not going to change a configuration file in a way that will mess anything. It's going to check the config if it's the right way or how you've set it up. It, uh, it ensures that it is um, identical every time. So this is uh, just a quick uh, inventory file that I kind of whipped up for uh, the Pelicap. Um, just specifying a couple things, you know, where your public key is, 
you know, password, uh, Tor is the default. Um, and you can add more stuff in here. Uh, I just put this up here so you guys kind of get a simple idea that, you know, YAML is not hard to write in and you guys can roll with it, um, you know, if you uh, have this. All right, I will talk about this one. This one's kind of the one that I uh, invented here. Um, so who's done a wireless assessment before? All right, a couple of people. All right, for people who have not done a wireless assessment, this involves going to an organization, walking around, and one of the first things you're gonna do is capture all the SSIDs from all of the APs that are inside the organization, okay? Uh, next thing you're gonna do is, after you've captured all that data, you're gonna run and do either whatever, attacks, depending on the WPA2, enterprise, so on and so forth, right? Um, historically, I have this laptop I'm holding in my hand with a bunch of, uh, what is it, um, alpha cards attached to the side and walking around and doing this whole assessment, okay? It's a pain in the butt. Uh, if anyone has dealt with VMs, right, on Kali, running Kali VM, apt-get upgrade and just see you tomorrow, okay? It's just, it's horrible. Um, so that's why I built this device. Uh, I wanted to do testing and I wanted to make it extensible. So the Pelicap is designed for Wi-Fi testing, but it's a lot more than that. So this device is pretty much it right here. Uh, I bought a Pelican case. It's got a, um, an ARM processor in there. You can, or um, the Raspberry Pi 4. There is a PoE hat on top of that, and then there's LTE. So you have out of band, you have PoE. There's a battery. There's two Panda USB uh, wireless devices in there. Um, if you haven't used the Panda, it's actually better than the Alpha Card, pretty much turnkey. I was at Def, uh, Def Con's, uh, wire, I competed in Def Con's wireless um, CTF this year. Everybody had Pandas. They also had some pretty wild cases. I saw people with like full computers and it's, it's crazy. Anyways, um, but uh, the point is it's got two um, Panda cards. They're both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, two of them. So you can split those channels out. There's also a crazy radio in there. If anyone hasn't played with that, it's a great keyboard attack. Multiple organizations I've gone to compromise their keyboards and uh, inject keys. Here's a quick rundown. So it's the Pi 4. There's PoE power, all day battery. I've done about three assessments with this kit and I can run over 12 hours on one battery uh, doing collection and everything like that. Um, LTE out of band. So the great part about this is that when I get onto this box, the way that I do it is I connect via Bluetooth, not Wi-Fi. Um, you can get uh, IP over Bluetooth, hook up your phone or a um, tablet, and you can run commands. So you can run commands straight from the SSH, or the best part is that I can do apt-get install with the LTE hat right on there. I don't have to figure out how I'm gonna pipe internet into this device to keep going. It just simplifies life. Um, Dual band wireless, like I said, the crazy radio. And then also the last piece of that, there's a GPS in there. So GPS antenna, we do uh, war driving, we get signal uh, dispersion from outside the facility. To do that, you need a GPS antenna, so. Yeah, and the, uh, the LTE hat that we're using, in case anybody is interested, is a company called SixFab, that I guess within the last, what, like six months or so, put out uh, an LTE hat that you can get for various providers. And uh, we've used, wait, do you have an AT&T card or T-Mobile? I have the T-Mobile card. T -Mobile. It, they work for all the providers. Yeah, and so, and, and uh, Bo and I have tw Twilo, Twilio, Twilio. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's and, you know, if anybody's messed with the USB dongle before, the LTE hat is way more stable. And it just seems to work, which, you know, wor working is good. It's also pretty fast, 50, 60 megabit, no problem. So um, if you got to really move some data. Uh, the other device. So, okay, so I built this wireless device. I was like, oh, I got this Wi-Fi thing. This is great. Uh, what about on assessments where I need to leave a drop device, okay? Uh, I do a lot of physical assessments. We break into buildings. We're doing this very covertly. Uh, this is part of a longer engagement. We've already got access to a lot of things. We're trying to elevate that access, or maybe we don't have access at all. Some of these organizations that we're dealing with, they're huge. They actually have real security budgets and they do care. So they'll have NAC. They have all of these features. They're doing everything they can. And that's where this came in. So the Shadow Pi is a pretty much taking just the Pi out and then putting it in another device. So the plant came up as an idea, a UPS, an APC, pull out the battery, put that device in there, plug that underneath a desk. Nobody's going to unplug their computer to unplug the APC ups that, you know, IT just gave to them. They were very nice. And then... The last piece of this is how does this communicate out? So I got the first piece, right? So we have the Pi, we have LTE, so now I got a VPN, right? I've put it in a case that nobody's gonna suspect, but what am I capturing? The last piece is a USB keylogger, okay? This is a Wi-Fi based USB keylogger. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a connection Wi-Fi 
to that or to that um, Raspberry Pi four, and I'm going to capture all your keystrokes. It's just about almost impossible to detect. Okay, I don't care if you got Meraki or whatever. You're probably not going to be looking for every AP that uh, you know broadcast outside. So, go ahead. Yeah. So to kind of go off of what he was saying, the, the keylogger, like this is how small this thing is. This thing is amazing. It's, so it's from a company called Key, Key Log with two E's. And like he said, it, so the, the cheaper model uh, just stands up an AP, like a wireless AP, and you can connect to it. Um, the one that's, I think it's like $37, um, will connect to your own AP. So you can set up your own wireless network. So the idea here with this attack is, um, <laughs> well, here, let's, let's, let's show kind of what it looks like. So this is what the interface looks like. Um, when you're capturing keystrokes, it's, it's a what it, this thing sets up a web server and, and you can intercept keys with it and it attaches to Wi-Fi. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> um, the cool thing is, is that, uh, this thing is actually so low powered that, uh, software that's actually built to detect key loggers. Um, we, we were on an assessment last week where we were testing a company. We did this with this company. They have a security product that the whole point of it is to detect key loggers and, uh, and other HID devices, so human interface devices. And the way it's supposed to do it is detect voltage changes. So like, you know, you remove the keyboard, you plug something else in, and then plug the keyboard into the back of this. Theoretically, it should change the voltage on the port, um, but it didn't trigger. So um, stealthy, I guess. <laughs> um, all right, so this is kind of how we're going to map this out. We have an attacker server, right, where we're going to end up retrieving the keys on in the cloud somewhere, right? Um, we're going to go, we're going to plant these. Um, we're going to plant the Pelicap, the, the, you know, our, our pen test Dropbox in the location, but not actually attach it to the network, right? So this is never touching the target's network. This is just in the vicinity of these key loggers, right? Key loggers communicating to that, that LTE out to our cloud, um, never touches the target network. We just intercept keys the whole time, um, which is, you know, just, find the system admin desk. I don't yeah. know. You think he's going to type his password in once? <laughs> Possibly. This is another fun one. You want to talk about the shortcut files? So not just in relation to uh, the Dropbox, but this is actually one of my mo one of my favorite attacks to do on an assessment. How, how many people work for a company where you have a, a, a share where you, everybody just dumps data? Yeah, and, and at least one person's going to raise your hand, and everybody else is probably not telling the truth anyway. Right? <laughs> because I mean, it's a skeletons. Really it's yeah, it's a really common thing, and and we we've ran into companies where they're just not doing good uh, good good security, and so what you can do. And there's actually a module in Metasploit called multi-drop that you can just create one of these things. You create a link file, and the resource for the icon and the link file uh, points back to a UNC path to the server that you control. In this case, it's going to be pointing to our Dropbox. Um, or if there's 445 open outbound, you could just send it out to, to the internet. Um, and then what happens when you view it in Explorer, Explorer tries to render the icon file, so it goes off and tries to make a connection with that UNC path, and it tries to authenticate over NetNTLM v2, essentially just gather hashes because somebody's viewing the, the icon or viewing the link file, the shortcut file, in Explorer. And, uh, ah, yeah. man. So this is another thing we did um, last week, and we put, I think on maybe like six or so shares, we put this link out there, a you know, shortcut file. And sure enough, a domain admin at this organization navigated the share and triggered, and we, were, we actually had set up NTLM relaying at the time. Um, so that's another thing to, to look at is, you know, if, um, if you scan a network and you find that SMB signing is disabled, you can relay credentials still. If SMB signing is enabled um, and enforced. Then, medium level finding. Yeah, medium Nessus. level finding in Nessus. Um, you know, so those get overlooked quite a bit. Yeah, those mediums uh, will get you. So what, what you can do, though, is uh, with, with the types of hashes that happen um, over the network, right? So if Windows Explorer tries to authenticate to something, it does an NTLM v2 or v1 if it's enabled um, handshake. And it's, it's actually a challenge and response that happens. So they're, they're not hashes that you can reuse on the network, with, like your traditional NTLM. So like if you get an NTLM hash from a system, um, actual NTLM, not v2, um, you can reuse that. You can do pass the hashtags. You can't do that with this type of thing, but you can go crack it. But uh, with NTLM relaying, you can actually point that system or that uh, authentication somewhere else on the network. So you find something that doesn't have SMB signing, like let's say a server somewhere, right? And you know that you know the domain admins navigating the share. Just you know, wait for him again. He's going to trigger it. It connects to us, attempts to authenticate, 
And we can actually relay that credential to the server and actually execute code on the server itself as the domain admin. And so we did that. That's, yeah. Does anybody think that's fun? I think that's fun. Yeah, it's a fun that's attack. That's pretty fun. <laughs> you want to do this one? Yeah, sure. So this was another attack we thought of for organizations that have everything. Uh, and this is the whack-a-mole uh, pine pineapple nano. Here, next one. So the way this attack works is kind of the same thing. We're talking about the key loggers. So one thing is that I really do want to plug into a network port, but I just got to assume that you're going to detect me, okay? So instead of plugging in my device that has LTE, why don't I get a couple nanos, plug those in, okay? Disable the ethernet, control them via Wi-Fi, and then individually start enabling them and see if you detect me. So I'll enable the first one. All right, they got NAC. Okay, they figured this out. They went and found it. All right, I'll enable another one somewhere else in the facility. So now you got to tear apart the whole facility finding all these things. Um, but anyways, it's another way to kind of pivot off that uh, drop device that's already there, out of band LTE, and still be able to, you know, hopefully compromise the network. You might end up to an organization, you assume they have everything, they don't see a thing, right? But if they do, we move to the next device and keep going down the line, so. Now, so now we're going to talk about a couple other, maybe not Dropboxy, but kind of a wireless type things. Uh, does anybody in here uh, use Kismet and maybe go war walking, war driving, something along those lines, right? So the first time I ever did that, I had a laptop in my, you know, my car, and I put antennas on top, and it was kind of conspicuous, right? Um, so instead of doing that, I uh, got this idea from uh, a blog post I read somewhere, uh, just taking an old Raspberry Pi in a case with a, uh, with, um, with a, a, um, a screen on it so you can kind of control it while you're out in the field. Like the Bluetooth pan's fine, but sometimes you need a screen. Um, and use that to go walking around. I mean, a, a Raspberry Pi that's in your backpack, whole lot less power, a whole lot less to deal with than an actual laptop. You don't have to worry about the thing going to sleep or anything like that. Um, and so it's based on uh, the Kiss Pi build from someone called Elkin Taro on uh, Twitter and Medium. Uh, and uh, you can configure the Bluetooth pan uh, to, to control it. It's convenient, but the screen actually takes a little bit more battery to run. So the next thing, has anybody in here ever heard of a Ponagachi? I know that there's a couple Ponagachis around because mine up here actually has made friends, right? So Working so together. I know they're working together, right? So the Ponagachi is really neat. Before I start talking about it, I actually have one to give away. So at the end of the talk, uh, whoever asks questions out of the people who ask questions, I have a Ponagachi that I'm going to give away, or the components to one. You get to build it yourself because that's sort of the whole idea behind it. So. What this is, is basically, uh, first and foremost, it's a way to get uh, hackers up out of their chair and go walk around, which we all agree that's a good thing, right? Um, so the, the folks that invented it, um, it's an AI-based uh, device. And I know, say what? I said, said it. AI. It's a, all right, so you have to drink, because I said AI. I'll say machine learning, too. All right, drink. Oh, we're right? all going to be hammered. I know, right? Right, right. So... Uh, so instead of doing something, I think their example on their websites, instead of say, playing Super Mario Brothers, it actually learns from collecting Wi-Fi crackable material uh, in, the, in the, uh, the overall Wi-Fi environment. It has some really neat features. Uh, uh, it, learn, it gets better over time. I've actually taken the Kiss Pie out and my Ponagashi out, and the Ponagashi gets way more handshakes. It really does a, a, a great job. It does passive sniffing, sniffing and it also does uh, uses better cap to do disassociations. Um, and so I'm really not doing it justice. I think we're going to probably have to move on. But if you want to talk about the Ponagachi afterwards, uh, I'll be right outside, uh, out of the booth. But one of the main reasons I built the thing was for when I go on wireless assessments, you know, if you, if you go on on site as a consultant, what's the first thing that happens in the morning when you show up? There's a meeting, right? You have to go for like an hour-long meeting and kind of sit there and you know, interface with the customer. Well, I would like to kind of automate what I do. And so instead of after that meeting, getting my laptop up, trying to figure out drivers for my alpha on my, uh, you know, my, my, my See colleague. You next Tuesday. Um, yeah, right. Spending until lunchtime trying to figure out why the alpha isn't working. Like that's never happened before. So no, now I take the Ponagachi and I'm probably going to get your handshake while I'm sitting in that meeting, right? And so while it does, I think mine over its lifetime has 508 
handshakes. I built it last November, so that's not bad, right? Um, but obviously, I'm not cracking them without authorization. But if it's the wireless assessment for you and I capture your handshake, yeah, I get to go try and crack it. Oh, uh, this is the James Bond layer. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone know where that layer is from? It's kind of dark to see. The data center in Sweden, actually. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Next one. All right, so we're just going to talk uh, quickly about uh, some stuff you can use for those ARM processors at home, right, to security stuff. If you guys haven't heard of Pi Hole, it's really cool. Uh, DNS blacklisting, DNS uh, black hole is really what it is. Get rid of all those ads. Uh, your significant other may be upset, though, when they can't shop properly. But uh, there's ways to whitelist, so on and so forth. I get to hear this from my wife all the time. No. Next. Uh, another one, IP Fire. This will, is a firewall you can run um, on your ARM device. Very inexpensive way to kind of get up a uh, firewall rolling um, at, at your home network. Uh, there's a bunch of other ways to do this, too. But uh, this is uh, ARM based. Oh, and then this one I just added in there for fun. This is a Kubernetes cluster. Has anyone heard of Kubernetes? You should drink after hearing me say the word. Man, we've got all kinds of buzzwords. I know. This is buzzword there. bingo. Anyways, Kubernetes. so Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Um, anyways, the point here is this cluster is uh, just a bunch of Raspberry Pis. Uh, the bottom here, uh, they're PoE powered. And um, what do you call it? Uh, this is a great way to learn how to use Kubernetes, uh, play around with it. If uh, It's uh, definitely emerging in the security field, right? They're having whole tracks about it. So if you want to play around with it, not spend a million dollars, and also have more than one node, great way to play. I mean, and when you have parties at home, who wouldn't want to talk about your cluster of Raspberry Pi 4s that you're running Kubernetes on? It's a pretty good piece. My wife likes hearing it. All right, so anyways, uh, here are some links. Uh, we're going to put the talk, all the slides, so you didn't have to take pictures if you did. Sorry. Uh, the Pelicap, we actually have the build where we took a picture of how we put it together. Uh, feel free to modify, change it, use different cards, get creative with it. Uh, but we have all the pictures, kind of the steps to put it together. Uh, I think it's a fun build. If somebody comes up with a cooler, creative way, I am definitely all ears. Uh, the Shadow Pi, uh, I got build and um, for that as well. Just kind of some ideas of how you might do that. Uh, again, get creative. Uh, Hack the Planet IO, we do a show. I uh, just thought I'd put a quick one out there. Yeah, and we, we have all these devices with us, so feel free to you know, come up after yeah, the talk come check it come out. by the, you know, the booth and take a look, because who doesn't like hacker toys? And I think that's questions. That is it. Yep. How you doing? Hi. I'm Mr. Silver. Those don't know me. Um, with that automation on... So the question for those in the back was, uh, on the vulnerability scanning stuff, uh, you know, is there a solution or do you just have to move up in terms of, uh, you know, scanning from one of these kinds of devices? And, you know, we were actually kind of surprised, I think, that Nessus didn't have an ARM build and that OpenVAS did. I mean, you would think that, you know, that Tenable would... You know, I, I guess maybe there's just not a market for it. Nessus is mostly written in Python, for anyone who doesn't know, so I don't understand. Which that also surprised me, but hey, whatever. Um, so I think the answer is, yeah, if you're going to do a vulnerability scan, you're probably going to have to give the client uh, an ISO or get some kind of higher powered device. I shouldn't even say that. It doesn't even have to be higher powered. I think the Raspberry Pi 4 has plenty of power. I mean, you can scan from... It just has to be x86. Yeah, it's just, it's just the architecture and its support for it, right? I mean, there's probably some creative solutions, too. Like, you could probably set up over the VPN, even over the LTE connection or whatever. You could probably proxy through. Um, and your mileage may vary, but I think the answer is, is it's just probably not there yet. Yep. Go ahead. Like the plant at a device? Oh, yeah, putting it in a plan as opposed so, to, like... So you're asking about war stories, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right. right. This uh, could so, take her. so the question for those in the back, where is the most interesting place that you've had to plant one? Well, under the desk in the middle of L.A., that was kind of fun, right? Because the, the, the guards, actually, while we were there, they actually, later on, they were on to us. They just didn't say anything, and they actually had Googled, um, uh, you know, the cloner that we were using, right? The, uh, what, God, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh... 
Proxmark, yeah, yeah. So they were like walked by and saw us sitting out there, like cloning badges, it's, like just sitting out in the lobby of this building. So that was kind of interesting. Another one that I did was uh, we went to uh, like a government manufacturer type facility where you know if we were actually attacking the kind of place and got in trouble, kind of put you in Gitmo kind of place. Um, and um, we, I was able to get into their two-factor data center. Um, and, and plant a device in there, right? So uh, that uh, two factor. Anyone want to guess how I got past the biometric fingerprint lock? <laughs> Under the door tool. UDT. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I did one at a power facility uh, where I'd walk around with a hard hat and then you know started looking at stuff which I had no idea how any of this stuff works. By the way, so I'm just looking around like, oh, what am I supposed to be doing? And I find one computer in the whole place and uh, put a drop device behind it. It was like inside of a building. It was it was wild. Uh, my, probably my favorite physical of all time was one that Derek and I was on. And so I got to call my boss and say, hey, can I expense a guitar in? Because we were attacking a recording studio. And the answer was yes. The answer was yes. yes. So we, we expensed in guitar and we walked in as musicians and they let us uh, actually go into a, like a recording studio like practice room. Did you play? And they left us there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. We planted the device in, in the recording studio. It was awesome. It was, yeah. The actual room, so yeah. it was. Yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, another one. So, what is the course of action when uh, the device is discovered by someone? They throw it in the trash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No. I mean, we'll ask for it back at the end of the engagement. Uh, you'd be surprised, kind of. Uh, like a lot of times, uh, most of the engagements, they'll find a device, but we're already so far along that once we tell them what's going on, I mean, I've had literally stuff like panic people calling because they didn't know. Like, so they'll be, uh, like the CISO knows about it, but everyone else on the other team doesn't, right? That's the whole point. And they're panicking at that point. They have no idea. They found this device, you know, they think Russia's here or whatever you may insert, you know, name of country. And so, yeah, one of the things we've done is we've put like our company sticker on the inside of the case yeah. of the device. So uh, it's like business card. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Business card. Like yeah. call, call us, you know. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, and that's something else that uh, comes into building a drop device. Do not build a two thousand dollar drop device. Okay, <laughs> it's a dumb idea for a bunch of reasons. One, it's overbuilt. But no, uh, it, you you don't know if you're going to get it back or not, and then you have to expense it to the customer. The customer may be upset that you're bringing a really expensive device. That cost about 500 to build the Pelicap. That's because of all the 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 wireless cards, the LTE, everything. It adds up, but. To build just the hat with the LTE, um, you could probably get that for about a couple hundred dollars, which is probably where the pressure points should be for a, um, what do you call it, a drop device. Mm -hmm. Right, a couple hundred dollars. Uh, a couple oh. questions, actually. Uh, so, have you tried using something like Aura instead of the software to bring the cost down? You mean as far as the adapter itself or as far as the network? I, I have never used that before, no. And are you talking about the price of the plan? I think the data plans are like $10 or something. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, and that's also, so anybody else who also uh, wondering GSM, it's still out there. There's some really cheap ones out there. You can kind of get into that. It's really low data rate though. So just be cognizant of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they get around it and they're figuring out, like, hey, what is this doing? What's it calling out to? And stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, you definitely could have that scenario. We talked about that. Yeah. What's up? No, I was saying, we, we talked about this. We had, we had this conversation. Like, yeah. What, what and I mean, I, I haven't personally had it where they went too far because usually think about it this way, right? If your team finds this thing, they're not going to, the CISO and whoever actually knows, they're not going to let them spend, you know, the next five days tearing this thing apart and doing off-chip circuit removal, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's not really a good, you know, at that point, you got to call it and say, hey, they got inside. Because that test is not just about getting access to the network. It's also about the physical security, right? And that's the other piece that we need to bring it around to. Yeah, and their response to that physical security breach. Exactly. Any other questions? I think we got two more minutes. Oh, yeah, go ahead, man. Yes, uh, they're not up yet. Uh, uh, they will be. I, I got to put it to a PDF. The uh, bat, bla yeah, Black Hills. And the last thing was the Dropbox device. Have you ever used one that looks like an actual network? Just place the folder? 
Yeah, so I mean, you could totally do that. I, I think isn't that what the uh, the poem plug pretty much was? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it's just look. It looks like a it looks like a uh, power brick. Yeah. yeah, like just a power brick or something like that. Get creative with it. Like the more it looks like something that's in the office. I mean, go around, walk some corporate offices or walk around your office if you, uh, and look at what people have on their desk. You'd be surprised what people have on their desk. I mean, another one is picture frames. That'd be a great one too. It'd be a little tough with that size, but you know. Yeah, you know, one time we actually entertained the idea of writing an Android app and sending someone an actual tablet and then having the app uh, pre-installed where it would do text-to-speech for Google. It worked really well, except the tablet didn't have enough horsepower to do it. But So, yeah, it's, it, it, the sky is pretty much the, the limit. And one of the things we were uh, trying to get done for this talk was actually 3D printing a custom case, but... Apparently, our 3D design skills, you know, hacking not does up not to snuff. really. Yeah, I can buy of. a printer, but I can't so, use it. Yeah, if I, I, I've, I'm, I printed a Ponagachi case that I downloaded, right? But if anybody in here is a 3D modeler, yeah, we should talk. Yeah. So how did you get the plant past physical security? The plant? <laughs> the plant? Oh. <laughs> a backpack, Okay. So, you know, normally walk in with just a backpack on your back. Uh, typically, once we're doing that piece of it, it's usually I already have a clone badge. So I'm coming in looking as an employee. I'll come in the after hours and stuff like that. Um, it, it's wild. Some, some places you go in, it's totally clean desk, and you won't find anything, not even a computer. And other places you go in, and there's just, like, people who have desks with just mounds of papers. I mean, it's just treasure troves of stuff. It's just so. But yeah, yeah, backpack. I'd say the number one way we get in on physicals is cloning badges. Yeah. I guess people have a false sense of security that those hid readers are actually s secure. They're really not. But that's actually a whole nother talk. Yeah, a very different talk. Been done many times. All right. Uh, if that's it. Uh, yeah, so I think we're out of time. So uh, just uh, uh, can you come by our booth? Yeah. All yeah. Right, cool. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks, everybody.